What's up, Podheads? Back with another episode of the Podio Slate Podcast. My name is Tony, joined as always by Anthony, and uh, we just had a phenomenal conversation, but we'll get to that in just a second. We, we also uh, were recording this after we saw a pretty big reunion show in Boston over the weekend. So, Anthony, how you doing, man? I'm awesome, man. I'm, I'm good to go. I'm excited to talk about the show we saw. I'm excited to, you know, kind of dig into the conversation with Henry at Boston Manor. And you got me thinking. What constitutes a reunion? Yeah, right. These days, you know. So we're, we're talking about the have heart. We'll call it reunion in Boston, which at the time of recording was a few days ago. But they last played in 2019. Haven't released music since 08. I think there was one maybe like B side that kind of got released a few years ago. But what <laughs> what constitutes a reunion these days? I don't even know. Right, and they and they've played a handful of gigs this summer, right? They played Sound of Fury, they played Tied Down, they played a show in Brooklyn. Uh, they played, you know, a couple of just four or five one-offs and Boston being the last one that was on the schedule. So hopefully there's more down the line from those guys, but you're right. I'm not sure what a reunion is because it has been five years for them and they didn't just play one show and say, see ya, we'll be back in five years. They did give us a little more this summer. So I'm hoping that means maybe there's possibility of music there's a possibility of a, them playing a handful of shows again next year that'd be pretty cool yeah i'd love to see it and and again I, I don't think they're i mean i don't know them personally but i don't know that their personal situations lend itself to a full-time band or if they'd want to you know kind of mess with the legacy i don't know there's, there's so many reasons why a band may or may not want to do something but i'm stoked to have seen it again and in a crazy way i kind of like that it was five years the mm. show that we saw a couple days ago it would not have been that special if they played more often. It wouldn't have been. That was pent up demand. A lot of old people, you know, old, old heads, as they say, from back in the day, reliving it. A lot of new people that came in, you know, maybe from the recent wave of, of whatever. And it was a special night. So it, it was at Roadrunner in Boston. Full lineup was what? Have Heart, Speed, Gel, Initiate, Eye for an Eye, and Wound Man. Uh, which we saw, we we got there for uh, Eye for an Eye, which is an uh, older Boston band that we never saw back then. We saw Gel, we saw Speed, and Have Heart. So oh, everyone that we saw was awesome. Yeah, and stoked for me the first time seeing them. Like that's the I, I was not around for the early day stuff. You were down in in Boston and the area surrounding it, and got to catch them in a lot smaller venues with less people <laughs> than what we saw the other night. But it's amazing what has happened with the legacy of that band and the people that have gravitated towards that group and, and what it means to be a fan of that band. And just watching people, like that was why I went, was to see the spectacle of the entirety of the show, not just the music on stage, how people reacted, how the crowd went off. Uh, you know, the stuff that happens on stage, which is always wild. Uh, you took an amazing photo of somebody who was like, looks like he's running on people's heads. It was just, it was a wild evening. And uh, I'm so happy to have been able to, to check that out. And, and, you know, as a fan of music, see, see the impact that Have Heart has had on our region and, and that scene. I know the photo you're talking about. It, it was during Boston's, it was during, right before the, so I could be the boy, you know, the line where it's just Pat isolated. Before that, this dude had headwalks, I think, from one of the amps on stage under the crowd. And I caught a photo <laughs> of the dude midair. And he looks like, you know, air it's Jesus amazing. or something. He's got his ha hands spread out and like a Michael Jordan thing. But I'll, I told you this in the ride home. I've seen him, uh, I'd have to look, maybe 10, 12 times. That could have been the best time because I think that was the best crowd reaction. And you know what? I would have said the same thing back in 2019. When they played, nice. I was there for the first night at the Palladium indoors. That was the best reaction they ever had. I think even bigger than the, the last show in um, 09 or whatever it was. Yeah, it was a special show. And Speed was... Speed is something of force of nature, man. Jeez. You can't fake the funk there. That's, you're either born with that 
amount of energy and enthusiasm and passion or you're not. You, you can't fake that. Gel was great. They had a great reaction. And then I for an eye, I don't think a lot of people were familiar with them, to be honest with you. But those that were in for them, I mean, there were dudes that looked 50 stage diving. Yeah. I don't know if you saw. They were. And, and it was awesome. I, I was there for every second of it. We weren't those people. Uh, as 40-year-olds, we didn't get up there and jump off the stage, although you see it and you're like, if they catch me, I, I'd kind of be down for that. <laughs> but <laughs> too much yeah. can go wrong at our age. But there were people that were like, I don't care. I'm back in it. Let's, it I'm 20 again. Let's, let's go dive off the stage. And people, people fucking love that shit, man. It's, it's cool. Yeah, and there's videos and photos. Go check out Eye of the Storm, Todd Pollock. He posted some photos. Return to the Pit probably has photos up by now. Sonny from Hey Five Six was there. I'm sure that'll see the light of day. Although the 2019 Half Heart reunion video has not come out yet, so really? I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, hasn't. Yeah. I think they want to. I'm not sure what. I think they wanted to make sure it was done right. I'm excited. If you weren't there, go on social media. Go on Twitter. Go on X. Go on Instagram. You'll find videos of it, and it's special. The sing-alongs are the loudest you've ever heard in your life. It's it was a special night. I'm glad we made the track. Me too. Yep. All right. What do we do tonight? We had a conversation with Henry Cox of Boston Manor, which was one that we, you know, being newer to the band, even though we've heard the band, you've seen them live, Tuan, we're excited to see come across our desk. We're like, oh man, we have a chance at that? Like we've, we've been digging what we've heard from the new record and stuff that came out a couple of years ago a little bit. And all of a sudden we have a chance to talk to Henry. We're like, yeah, we're all in. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. I, I love when this stuff happens and I prefer th- I don't know if I prefer it. I, I'll just say this. I love these scenarios where we kind of get into a band five albums in, we'll call it, whatever it is, and then EPs, because you have all of this back catalog. It's like getting into a director, like after they have all their footing under them, and you can see the progression, you can see the growth, you can see the creative chances taken. I love that. And with these guys, you, we talked to Henry in the interview about it. You can see the stair steps to get to Detura, which is the last album of this kind of two-part album series and then sun diver which comes out what september 6th sharp yep. tone yep that's a great home for them i know they were on pure noise before that also a great home uh for for that sound at the time but i'm with you i'll broken record this shit half the fun is not knowing what's around the corner and i don't know that we would have even thought to interview henry you know what i mean until pretty recently absolutely and then you know just finding new music and and realizing you're like you said there's five records back there and an ep to, to dig into and be able to you know kind of wet your whistle on something you haven't haven't spent enough time with certainly going to do more of that as the year goes on here but this new record sundiver dropping on september 6th is definitely worth your time and and we say it i think uh, with henry in the interview if you like us and you like what we've had on here in any way shape or form you're going to dig this record you're going to dig this band so be ready to, to check that out on September 6th when it drops. One last thing, it just reminded me of. Imagine if you got into Breaking Bad at like season five and you have this whole catalog to, to, to binge, right? Same idea. I, yep. Those are the best. That's the best scenario for me where I can just binge all these past seasons and then get caught up. But yeah, they're going to be touring uh, Australia, Europe, and the UK. Uh, album drops in, you know, probably a few weeks, we'll say, from now, September 6th, and, and we're here for it. So I think we're going to get into it right now. Henry Cox, Boston Manor. Henry, Boston Manor, welcome to the show. Thanks for uh, coming on with us. Thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. So this, this one might be a different interview f- for you, only because we don't have like the legacy with Boston Manor that maybe other folks do. Like We're relatively new i mean we we saw you maybe four or five years ago but we never deep dove the catalog really until this album cycle so it's in, it's interesting like this new album is largely our first exposure that's awesome i i hope there are, there are many other people that have the same experience to be honest because uh, <laughs> that's the whole goal right but i think uh i think a lot of people have that i've chatted to um, have come in at, at different points for different reasons, which is really cool. I, I can't point to one sort of like record that we released where, you know, that's where all our fans came from and then et cetera, et cetera. It seems that whether it be a tour or an album cycle, there's, there's been an entry point for, for, for everybody and, and, and it, it varies largely, which is, which is great. Yeah, getting more people under the tent, right? You want, you want to find 
more fans. That's the goal. Yeah. That is the goal, of course. Um, how did you hear about it? Just, just through the press circle and Spotify? Or... I mean, we've known the name. We've known the name for a while, but it was Spotify. And it was, a, it was the Knock Loose Data Remember Tour in the U.S. where we saw you. Of course. But the deep diving was, was Spotify. It was what? Sliding Doors, right? Yeah, Sliding Doors popped up on my For You after I was listening to something else. And I was like, ooh, I like this song. And then we got an email <laughs> from your PR saying, hey, you, gotta, you, you want to talk to you know, Henry from Boston Manor? We're like, absolutely. Because that we're like already kind of deep diving just because that's what we do. And uh, we, we decided, let's, yeah, if, if he's down to chat, we're definitely down to chat. That's great. Yeah, that Not Loose Tour, Dave Remember Tour feels like a lifetime ago now. Oh, I was. I think 2019. It was 2019. I thought about this today. I was like, when was that? It was 2019. That was five years ago. Holy cow. Yeah, lots changed. <laughs> lots changed in that time frame. <laughs> I was going to say, I think anything that involved kind of that COVID stretch feels like double the length of time that it actually was as well. So, I mean, if totally. We, we were almost like a whole entirely different band from that point. So, yeah, that's awesome. We, we dug, we deep dove like Be Nothing and Neighborhood and Glue and up to a Detura, which is, you know, we did the research about, you know, it's, it's kind of a dual album with Sundiver. So like just time travel back in that 2019 tour, was this idea even a thing? No, no, not that. I would, I would love to pretend that I have this great foresight and master plan and know what I'm going to be making in six yeah. years time. But no, not, not at that point. We've been right glue. I, I can't remember at that point. I think we may, maybe had recorded glue. We're gearing up to do that album cycle. And then, yeah, first couple singles came out, and then, boom, COVID hit. And, and that was that. So that album almost got canceled. Like, we never really, we never did a tour off it. You know, we did the whole, like, live stream thing, like, fake gig thing. But uh, we, never, we never did much on that record. So as soon as that kind of album, we realized that we weren't going to do anything off it, we, we basically started writing the tour and, and then started to kind of flesh it out and realized that we kind of wanted to do a little more than um, than just release one album. We kind of wanted to do a double album, and then the kind of concept started to emerge. But we we put Sundiver on the back on the back burner until we had written and recorded the tour because we kind of wanted it to be a linear process. We didn't want to kind of I don't know preemptively write a record that we hadn't arrived at yet. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. And, and the tour was such a gloomy album, and it kind of, you can kind of tell a lot of it was written in lockdown. It kind of had this this sort of very uh, murky feel to it, but this sort of cloudy cloudiness, I don't know. So I feel like that was very befitting of when it was written, and the same as Sundiver, really, for different reasons. So you guys come up with the idea. Do you, it's an interesting idea in the fact that you don't actually just release them together they come out a couple of years apart. Was that always the plan? Yeah. Yeah. That was always the plan. We, we had, um, in fairness, we, we had planned to release Sundiver a little bit closer to the tour, but just, you know, it, it, we spent so long on making the record and, you know, shit happens. Basically we, we kind of wanted to make sure it was right and perfect. And had been doing some touring as well, but yeah, basically we had, al we had always intended to release them as two kind of A and B records that make up a, a larger whole, I'd kind of have a have a bit of time to be able to tour each one separately was the goal. When uh, and like I said, we we were not around for the Detoris album cycle. When that came out, was it was it positioned as a two part thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We had said that there was a second part to it, and it was funny because a lot of people were like, "This isn't an album; it's seven songs." <laughs> yeah. And we were like, "Well, actually, I think you'll find it fits the running time of an album, but part of a double album." So, uh, you know, we kind of gave that to people so that they kind of realized that it, there was more to come, I suppose. And, but we didn't want to give too much away. You know, I, I think a lot of people thought that Sundive was going to be another like sh mini album, if you will, rather than like a kind of more long form project. But yeah, I, I suppose we still kind of wanted to give it its own little moment in the sun as a, as a self-contained piece of work. I, I didn't want to kind of immediately start talking about part two or, or the fact that there was a second part but we also kind of did want people to know that it there was more this was part of a, a, a bigger project i guess i don't know kind of holding two thoughts in this in my head at the same time there but <laughs> yeah <laughs> was there any point during 
either creation where you guys were like, man, this is too much. Like, what the hell do we get ourselves into? Every day. That's kind of where I was going because <laughs> you're locked into it. You're locked yeah. into that idea if it's out there. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. And, and I was kind of, yeah, there was a few points where we were getting nervous where we were like, but we've kind of said that we're doing this. So we'll, because Sunday was so hard to make like were, it was the hardest record to make uh, for a lot of reasons it just took ages and we wrote the most songs for it there were so many songs that we put in the bin because it just kind of sucked and yeah there was definitely a few moments where we were like we kind of promised on something and we have to deliver and we've, we've sort of backed ourselves into a corner for a bit but that's kind of why we took, took our time because we never wanted it to feel like we were fulfilling a quota or an obligation we really believed in this record and wanted to to give it the kind of time that it needed to, very lame word, but blossom. I, I think that a lot of our, and I, yeah, I suppose you guys wouldn't know this because if you're fairly new to the band, but a lot, a lot of our kind of earlier records, we would tour so much. We'd tour like eight, 10 months of the year and then go and make records in between that touring. So it was just so nonstop for so many years. And then COVID hit, it's the complete opposite. But also we, we had kind of always been trying to like write on the road, and squeeze kind of recording time into kind of like whatever chunk we had off of time in between the tours. Whereas for this record, we had deliberately chosen to to kind of come to the studio for a, a week or so and then go home for a while and work on it a little more and then come back to the studio, which was really nice and really refreshing. And it gave us a real chance to kind of look at the big picture a lot and and try not to get too bogged down in the, in the details, which... I think in week six of making a record, when you've been stuck in the same studio for a long time, you start to just be like, that'll do. <laughs> Whereas this definitely <laughs> allowed us to uh, to be a little bit more, um, I guess, thoughtful about things. Well, I uh, I like how this all worked out because, you know, you dig back to the albums and I can see like the stair steps between each album. You know, there's not like, if you, if you look at Be Nothing to the new album, yeah, I mean, you, you could see like, you know, there's a there's a pretty big difference, but yeah. if you consider the albums, there's stair steps, and like with this Detora in in Sundiver, if in I don't know, I'd like to get your perspective on this. It feels like there were themes and chances taken that maybe you would have never thought of back in the Be Nothing days. Whether it's just comes from experience, it comes from confidence, it comes from trusting the process, any of that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't have said it about myself. I mean, I, I don't know if we, I don't know what kind of band I thought I would be in sort of eight years down the line when we made our first record, but um, it certainly wasn't this one. And I mean that in a, in a good way. Like, uh, yeah. it, we, we've, we've um, kind of constantly tried to sort of excite ourselves and surprise ourselves with the music that we, we, we make. And, um, and I'm, I'm really glad that you said that it seems like a sort of stepping, uh, like, step, like steps, because, uh, I, I always wonder, it's very hard to be subjective about your own, or sorry, objective about your own uh, music, obviously. And, and I always wonder kind of how that, how that kind of journey, for lack of a better term, comes across, particularly to people coming in uh, towards the end of our, the end, the, towards, towards the, the, the newer parts of our career, the most, the most recent records that we've made. But yeah, it, it really is one of those things where it's been one record to the next. Things have changed quite a, quite a bit. But then when you look at the whole picture, they've changed loads. But, you know, each thing is just kind of where we're at time musically and sort of building off things. And that's not to say that it's always been perfect. I think that we've definitely kind of taken some missteps creatively over our career. And we try to kind of take those into consideration when we come back to make a new record. We've, we've had a few creative missteps. And I think only in being a band that has now like essentially five albums, four or five albums, depending on if you count this as one whole one or, or part of one, that you get to have that uh, luxury of, of looking at all of it as a, as a whole thing. And it, it is weird to do. We, we drove super self-indulgent, but we, um, we had a music, we, we shot a music video on the other side of the UK uh, a couple of months ago, and we all had to drive down together just in, in a van on like an eight-hour drive. But it like wasn't on tour or anything, so we were just kind of chilling. And uh, we put on, on the way back from this music video show, we put on like all of the records in order, and, like listen, oh, listen wow. to them from start to finish. And some of the, some of that I haven't listened to in so many years, like some of the EPs and stuff. 
and it was it was mind blowing. Like uh, there was so much of it. I was like, wow, I forgot how different we were as a, as a band. Were you critiquing it at all? <laughs> that was what I was going to ask. Oh yeah. yeah, we were we were ripping the, like oh shit, we were I wish ripping we did dress. That. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was definitely the conversation of if we were still a pop punk band, would we be a lot richer right now? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those kind of combos too. Yeah. <laughs> As a fan of music, and I know Anthony and I are, are kind of a different breed when it comes to being music nerds. We we love all of it and find stuff in, in every genre that's cool. We like to see bands not just stay the same. You don't you didn't put out five of the same records. You know, like there's there's an evolution. You've taken chances, you've done stuff that's you guys, but also in a different way. We love to see that from any band that we're we're digging. And it's it's certainly evident with, with Boston Manor. That's awesome. And that's really nice of you to say. I think, I mean, I feel the same way in terms, as a fan of music. You know, I, I think some of my favorite bands have had real kind of sound shifts over the, over the course of their careers and stuff. And, and I, yeah, I, I agree. Like, I, even if I love a record and we all have those sort of, you know, 10, 20 records that are deeply personal to us, you know, in our lives and stuff. But I never really want that artist to go make the same record again because it's just not really doable, I don't think. You kind of always want to hear, or at least I do, the progression. Um, but we're super lucky that our fans have been like very open and and um, and have given us a, a lot of room to be creative and exper- experimental. And I think not every band gets that luxury. And I'm I'm just very grateful to both our fans and and, and the teams that have kind of nurtured us over the years and allowed us to do that because it is special. And I don't take it for granted. I think you're right. There, there's certain fan bases that want they want thrice to write another illusion of safety. You know, they just want they just want that, you know, that that type of thing. And as someone I mean, Tony and I've been doing this podcast for almost five years now. And I always think about this stuff, too. Like if someone listened to the early stuff to now, you know, it might not make sense, but there's stair steps that that got there. And I think if you hang around long enough, it's like, guys, fans of the early days, there's still stuff here for you. Just give it a chance, you know. Absolutely. And I, I feel that way about Sundiver. I think more so than some of the records that we've made after our, um, between Sundiver and our, and our first album, there, there is stuff that the, the real early, early fans will, will get out of it. Um, that's not to say that it sounds like that, but yeah, to your point, I think it's, it's always about like kind of cherry picking stuff, but, but also at the, sa- at the end of the day, like we're still the same five people we've, that have been in the band from day one, you know, so we've made all those records together. So there's still going to be an element of a personality that, that inevitably come out in the music depend no matter what kind of sound you, you're sort of going for and um and i should also say that we've the, on the tour and sundiver more than any other we've had like a real kind of vision that we've been striving towards to achieve a lot of our earlier records are are a lot more kind of like just sort of like scratching around and seeing what you find and then and then kind of um expanding on that and i do love doing that and i think we'll probably go back to that in the future because i think it's a very natural way of making music but we've never been sort of contrived and, and sort of said, this is exactly what we need to sound like. We've referenced this band and this band, and it's got to be exactly the same as this. And this is what it is, you know, because I think that's a really cynical way of, of creating art. And um, I think I'm all about the imperfections and even sometimes the, the, the misses, you know, the things that you really swing for and you don't quite get it right. But therein lies the, the kind of originality, I think. That's a great point. And, and putting, putting yourself out there and, and knowing that fans may not necessarily want to go along for that ride with you, but being, not being afraid to do it is, I love that shit. Like that's, that's what makes me a music fan is hearing these stories and, and finding out uh, a band is like, yeah, we, we're, we're embracing that. We're going to try something different. And maybe it's a three, four year odyssey of this kind of double album concept album. And yeah, you go along for the ride with us. Like, let's have fun. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I, it is scary as well. Sometimes you like, there's a, definitely a safer option you could play, but it's also not really uh, in in the, the the nicest way possible. It's not really worth it. Like, I I don't I don't make enough money out of this this career for me to be doing something that I don't really love doing. That's always kind of been our mantra. Really, it, mm-hmm. it's been. We're, we're doing this because it's so so uh, fulfilling and enjoyable for us to do so so yeah you know you've got to make music that you believe in and that you like and that i think that can seem a little bit like a, a thing that people just say but i don't think everybody does do that 
I think a lot of people get wrapped yeah. up in what's going on in the scene and what's going on in in the kind of the what the label's saying. Maybe less so these days, but at least at, at one time that was a big thing. And or they'll have a producer that's got a real kind of thing that they want to do, and they just people just kind of let them just go along with it. I don't know. I think I think it is really important to to just kind of take a step back and think about would you listen to this and enjoy it and, and do you get something out of it because um it's you can only make these out however many times and then you know you don't you don't get a million goes of this you know i love that i love that you said that because if you if you are a band that does what you just said you're always going to be two steps behind you know what i mean unless you can you know write songs really quick and get them out there you're always going to be a couple steps behind because you know, if you're chasing trends or, you know, doing, you know, the 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 hot new uh, sound that everyone's into, you're always going to be behind. Totally, I've I've always thought that it's a really good point. Because I mean, you, to put it into context for listeners, you know, let's say I'm a metalcore band and I hear that new Melt Loose record, uh, and I'm like, this is amazing, I love it. Even if I'm just genuinely a fan and I'm just like, I want to make more music like this. If I go and try and like, you know, rip it off, essentially, I got to write these songs. I got to go and record them, which I don't know how quickly you can do that. But if you're like an actual kind of band that go into a studio and, and make a record, you know, that's going to take you an absolute minimum of six months if you're like rushing things. And then you got to start your album campaign by you. And then you got to deliver it, mix it, master it, deliver it, get all the, the stuff you need to get lined up to do a record release. And then you got to do a, a campaign where you at least release like two singles. So you're talking like at least an absolute stretch sort of like, 15 months after that record's come out and, and by which point you just look like what you are which is a, a copycat so I, i've just even from a logistical point of view never understood the logic of trying to just repeat something that's already been done and and that's not i'm not criticizing people that are kind of taking inspiration because that's what we all do you don't just pluck music out of thin air it obviously is all informed by stuff that you like oh yeah you, hear, but there's, you definitely you do hear some you know some one for ones sometimes. I think, come on, man. Like, <laughs> right. You haven't even tried with this, you know? Great. Right. This is, I've heard this before. Exactly. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when you're bringing this idea, because you, you signed with Sharptone before Detura came out, did you bring the idea to them or were you already kind of in with Sharptone Records before that the idea kind of came to light? Yeah, good, good question. I'm trying to remember. I mean, we 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 did an EP before the tour, which was a bit of a warm up and kind of like a re introduction into kind of the studio for us. And we worked with a new producer, and we sort of recorded that in the pandemic, kind of. So we were sort of um, testing the waters with a lot of things: new label, new producer, that kind of thing. We delivered that EP, which I think was at the start of our relationship with Sharp Tone. And as soon as that had sort of come out, we kind of got into it but not so sorry not as soon as it came out as soon as we had kind of given them even demos of this song we had kind of i think told them what the plan for our next like full album is so obviously you sign on so many albums and stuff when you sign around uh, and they were super supportive they were really really generous with their um with everything with their time their money and their uh, their attention and then they've yeah i, I can't fault Sh sharp and they've been really great since we signed to them they've just been let us kind of do what we want really and then helped us yeah so the the album sunday it comes out at the time of recording it'll come out in maybe a month and a half but it comes out september 6 on uh, on, on sharp tone and we, we've heard it we've listened to it i've probably listened to it 10 times realistically it's heavy in spots it's dancey in spots i don't know if you'd agree with that but there's oh, totally, yeah. songs that are dancey there's tracks that i think whether it was intentional or not like just they showcase you 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 really shine on them oh, thank you. and i'm curious now that it's you know it's it's you know we're knocking on the doorstep here of september 6 now that the kind of this two-part journey is coming to a close at least from a release perspective where are you at with it are you like oh my goodness thank god this thing is out or is it like hey you know uh here we are <laughs> I, I i'm just really excited and, and i haven't felt this way about every record that we've released but I've I've had the board mix. Uh, well, I've had obviously got the whole mixes now. But we we normally get like a like a kind of rough mix down like the week after you leave the studio or whatever. So I've had that for like over a year now, I think, or nearly a year. And um, and I listen to it all the time. You know, every couple of days I'll like spin the record, and and I just really really love these songs, and I believe in them, and 
and yeah, I'm ex- I'm excited to share them with people, and obviously a little nervous. I think when you really believe in something, you you sort of obviously you want people to feel the same way, or at least um, or at least kind of acknowledge this thing that you work so hard on. But but I definitely am. It's the most confident I've ever felt leaving the studio in in kind of the quality of the songs. And thank you for being so kind and uh, about the record. That means a lot to us. And um, I we we I think there is a a lot of different stuff going on in the record so I, it, again it sounds like a real platitude but i do think that if you're listening and you like like one vibe of boston manor there's there's like lots to kind of sink your teeth into there it's not kind of one thing throughout but yeah i'm i'm super excited i'm a bit nervous and in a way i'm kind of sad because i quite like this period where you have this record that you're sitting on and not many people have heard it it feels like your little like your cool little secret thing that you've got yeah it's our little fight so, club uh, here. Yeah. Just don't tell anyone about it. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I, I, I always love the idea of doing like a secret album that just sits on the internet, but that costs too much money and uh, no one would fund it. So <laughs> I don't think <laughs> hey, that'll ever happen. Just do what Jack White just did. He, he put out a, like a hidden album only available at his third main at record the stores, store or something. Yeah. yeah. Yep. You had to go get it. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And at some point that's, that's so going to cool. hit streaming, right? It has to, but it, for now you have to go get it physically, which is, I mean, that's a throwback to 20-something years ago. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's sick, though. So you mentioned there's going to be something for, you know, any fan of Boston Manor's eras as we go here. Uh, listening to it, you guys, I would agree, there's a, there's a ton of different directions taken. There's a ton of different vibes, influences, if you were. Uh, I would, you know, there's dancey, there's upbeat, there's Deftones sort of vibes, there's smashing pumpkins vibes on there like you guys kind of made it a point and i know in the press release to say like we're, let's put our spin on some of this kind of older 90s sounding early 2000s sounding rock and i i, I certainly think you did how did you fit all that stuff into one record because i think you did oh awesome thank you yeah i mean hit the nail on the head like we've always been sort of we've always kind of referenced a lot of like 90s old stuff early 2000s old stuff some of the new metal bits because I, I guess that's i'm kind of a little young to have been there at the time but a lot of the stuff i was listening to when i was a teenager first getting into music was that stuff i i guess the main through line of it all has been it's been like guitar sounds I've kind of been chasing this really like big but bright sounding kind of tone but also kind of musical theme because we, we wanted this record to be kind of you know, the following day after the tour, it's all about kind of like this big, bright, burning sun that, that kind of hangs over the whole album. And that sort of feeling of like, you know, it's like really hot out. You look down the street, the line, the, the, the horizon's kind of waving, like kind of kind of blurry, that kind of feeling. But we didn't want it to sound super major and super like happy because it just not, doesn't, we don't sound very good when we, we make that kind of music. It doesn't come very natural to us. We want things to still sound like, you know, intense and, and not moody, but, but a little bit kind of, I don't, I don't know, I don't have the adjective for it, but I had vibe the, the most empty word to describe music, but uh, not, not kind of happy and cheerful, I suppose. But we still wanted to sound really positive and, and bright. So that was a real challenge. It took us a long time to sort of um, get that right. And, you know, that's down to everyone else in the band, but me, to be honest, it's there especially the guitarists there, they spent so long making that happen. And um, I think it's that, that that kind of runs through it. Because there are songs that do sound a bit sort of dark and moody on, on the record, but they all they all kind of like reference each other a little bit and have these, these sort of um, musical motifs and, and guitar sounds. You know, we even made our own pedal for this record. Wow. Mike, uh, our guitarist, collaborated with Life is Unfair Audio and, and made this pedal called The Bad Machine. Mainly he just made it because... It didn't exist and he wanted it. And we used it on the whole record. Like it, it sounds sick. And then we've now made it available to buy. So if, um, not deliberately plugging our web store, but if you did want to buy that pedal, it's on our web store. But it's, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, it's, it's sick. And, and, you know, that's how much detail he went into the guitar sound on this, on this album. The last record didn't have a lot of, quite well, obviously, we're a guitar band, so it's all on, on every record. But our last record was a lot more kind of synthy and electronic, and there's a lot more programming involved, which is the stuff that I love. Uh, but this one, we kind of decided to strip all that away, and, and it's mostly just big, loud guitars. Even stuff that might sound a bit like a synth is, is usually a guitar on this album. 
which was really good. And it was a good kind of anchor to keep this whole thing from kind of sprawling too too far and wide and out of control, really. Well, you mentioned you mentioned the word moody. The word that came to mind for me is haunting. There's some songs that have kind of a haunting vibe that, you know, if you're listening to this, you might be like, well, um, what does he mean by that? I think if you if you you'll know when you hear it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I know, I know exactly what you mean, definitely. I, I can hear sort of bits of the record in my head now that you're probably referring to. That's cool. Like, And the, the other thing was as well that we didn't want to have just this kind of resolution because then you have a very emotionally flat record. We didn't kind of want 11, 12 songs of just like positivity in a sense to, to be very binary. We, we, we wanted it to, to kind of like peak and trough and, and, and kind of ebb and flow emotionally as well as like musically so there's there's bits when you especially in the first half of the record where i guess thematically the, the record hasn't kind of reached its its sort of like turning point or its third act or whatever you want to call it so we were kind of conscious of that we wanted we want to feel like a like a journey or like a movie or something that had like a real beginning middle and an end to it so let's let's talk production how, how you guys sat down and did it. it it read that you did you weren't in the city you kind of went out to the country had cookouts every day uh, you know had some fun around <laughs> just paying attention to making the record uh, what was that like oh it was so good we realized that every record we've made has been we've like put ourselves through so much like uncomfortable misery making them we <laughs> we made the first first record we made was in a barn and we were staying in a room attached to the barn that had a rats and no heat and then Jesus. album two and three, we made in a beautiful studio, but it had no, it was in America, but it had no um, real accommodation. So we slept on the floor above an Italian restaurant next door. And also the record, the, the, <laughs> the studio was in like the middle of nowhere. So we were just trapped in this like kind of four block radius for like two months almost making these albums. And then Dottora was in lockdown or the tail end of lockdown. And it was in like a bunker where they just make like techno and there's no windows and the studio was really <laughs> small. Yeah. So, so um, this one was made in this lovely studio in our producer's, like uh, next to our producer's house in the countryside. And it was the summer and it was, he has a beautiful garden and we were, yeah, we were barbecue and stuff. And, uh, and then there was like a meadow opposite, like the Airbnb we were staying in. We had an Airbnb. That's, that, that's one nice thing. So yeah, we realized that we kind of, Maybe our records were a product of, of their, their environments, and that's why they sounded so miserable. But uh, this one was was great, and you know, we we I think we did consciously lean into that a little bit and and try and just make things as kind of blissy as possible when we were when we were making the record, and just kind of enjoyed it. And also the pace was just like I was saying before was so so much more chill. Like we we weren't in this like crazy rush. There wasn't there wasn't even really a deadline. It was kind of the record's done when it's done, you know? So, so yeah, it was, it was really pleasant. It, I mean, the record was difficult to make in terms of the writing of it, but the recording of it and, and, and kind of constructing of it was, was really great. And um, our producer, Larry's awesome. We have a really strong relationship with him now and he's, he's just really relaxed and easy to work with. So yeah, a, a really nice experience actually. I love hearing about this stuff, Henry, where like bands go on retreats, you know, they get, they get this <laughs> cabin or, you know, like I remember Incubus Morning View, they had this mansion that overlooked the water. They wanted inspiration. You know, all these. I, I love hearing this stuff. Be, being above an Italian restaurant, at least the food was good, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I smelt like it all day because all uh, my clothes yeah, of, uh, of garlic bread and stuff. But yeah, no, to be fair, the surroundings of that were pretty cool because it was on this marina. So we, we were sort of overlooking the water and um, and kind of hanging out. But it was it was just really weird and isolated. When we made the, the second album, it was in the winter and, and we, we, we were kind of, I, I didn't realize what kind of Northeast American like winters are like. And it, we were just completely snowed in for half it. It was, it was very much the shining. So That's we all got a little woods, bit, man. That's where we're a from. Weird. <laughs> Is it? Oh, right. Okay. It was uh, Lake, Lake Opakong in New Jersey where we were. Um, so kind of like three hours from any major city really. So, but it was, it was, you know, it was, I've gotten something out of every every record we've made and enjoyed the process of it tremendously. So the surroundings were still super cool and just added to it. But this one was just chill. Like that was the mantra all the way through. Just make it nice, make it chill. We ate great food. We um we hung out, watched a lot of great movies. So it was, it was lovely. 
Yeah, you, you hear that of bands. Well, we've heard on this podcast, bands going out to the desert and intentionally disconnecting, putting out to turn off your phones and you're just in a creative mindset. And it's interesting to see what you pull from that, whether it's your headspace, whether it's the scenery around you, whether it's even just good vibes, you know, the vibe oh, yeah. of where you guys are at now would be much different than being snowed in in the Northeast US. Oh, mate, yeah. We actually, we actually did a little bit of one of the records in just, just outside of El Paso on this like um, Pecan farm that was in the actual middle of nowhere, just in the desert. And it was like the end of the property was like the Mexico border. Uh, that was really cool. But that was like super duper duper remote. It was just like the studio. And then we had to like send somebody out to get like, like bottled water every couple of days kind of thing. So that was really cool. I can imagine being there for a whole, well, however long it takes to make a full album would be really intense. I think being that isolated, I don't know, but some people thrive off that. Like you say. Yeah. As long as you've got stuff planned, you've got water, you've got food and you're not really stuck in the desert. That, that would be tough. Oh yeah. So uh, the, the album art is interesting. We just looking at it. It's what it's a, a photo that uh, your photographer, Nick, uh, Nick Barkworth, I think is the name, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's from a sculpture in your hometown. Yeah. Yeah. It's just on the outskirts. It's really crazy. It's massive. It's probably like two stories tall. Oh, wow. It, it's been there as long as I can remember. It's like you kind of come off the, off the motorway. And if you're driving towards sort of like the north part of Blackpool where, where the brothers live, you kind of drive past it. And it's, it's just on this big this sort of corner plot, this like farm essentially. But I'd never even been in. And then I told my dad about this thing. And he's like, oh, that's, that's um, class four. That's such and such is worth. Like, you should go in and check it out. You've got this like open studio where you can go in. You've got all this incredible, um, incredible glass that he blows. But he's been building this thing for years and it just sits on the, the corner, almost like a big, I guess like a big advert for him. But it's a really cool thing. And I saw it and I was like, it just looks like what this record sounds like. This big, bright, kind of weird alien explosion of like, I don't know, just, just energy and, and, and kind of excitement and stuff. So yeah, we, we the, the tour, the cover art, all the kind of art direction was kind of following on the kind of empty streets in our hometown and interesting places. And off Nick Bart, who we work with, he, he's an incredible photographer and documents Blackpool in that sense really, really well. This was like, I don't know, we were initially going to kind of do the opposite of that and be like, we'll have it populate more people, you know, similar scenes, but really bright rather than at night. But then we still have a lot of that in the art direction and all the kind of inserts and stuff and the single art. But uh, for the cover, I was like, this just needs to be like right in the middle, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm super stoked on that. I just did a Google search and it, it's huge. It, and it's in like in the middle of a field and the full shape is almost like a funnel. You realize that's going to be the thing is people want to take photos with this, you know, and tagging so. you guys. I, yeah, yeah, you should go there on the, on the art. On, if you look on the cover, the coordinates are actually like hidden on the cover. So if you really care, you can find the coordinates and I put them in the little, in the corner. So you can go and find the coordinates and go and um, pay, pay that place a visit. We love the nod to the, the hometown stuff. I mean, as we're both from Maine, which is the, you know, extreme Northeast America. And we, shout that from the rooftops as much as we can so we love that you guys are doing that with your hometown stuff too oh yeah it's just uh it's the, kind of at the center of everything that we do and we we've always kind of talked a lot about it and made a point to it, we could kind of call it our muse in a way because it 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 kind of has been a big inspiration to, to to us and there's not many there's not really many bands at all that have kind of come from where we've come from or like the northwest of england and and been able to kind of do the things that, that we've been, the opportunities we've been afforded. So, um, yeah, you know, we're, we're very proud of where we're from. Maine's awesome though. I played there a couple of times, but I played Portland a couple of times. It's, it's a beautiful part of the world. That's, that's our, yeah, Portland. We, we grew up just across the bridge in South Portland, which is aptly named because it's just south of the city. And, uh, yeah. Uh, would you, would you play Port City? Port City Music Hall, maybe? I, I think so. Yeah. 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 I think that was it. Yeah. That, that was a cool little venue. We lost that in the pandemic, unfortunately. Oh, that's oh, such a shame. It's a beautiful yeah. place. Yeah, no, that, that's a real shame. But I, I love that city. I feel like not a lot of people get the chance to go up there, like tourists and stuff from outside of the US. And I recommend anyone who's heading over to the East Coast to go check that place out. Yeah, we're promoting your neck of the woods. People check out the glass sculpture. You're promoting Portland, Maine. This is great. This yeah. uh... cross-Atlantic cross uh, <laughs> partnerships. Yeah, I love it. Exactly, yeah. 
So coming up, you guys, so the album drops September 6th. You guys are going to spend some time in Australia for a few dates and then in, uh, in August. And then you're heading European show, right? Trophy Eyes and Split Chain. H what's the prep like for that? I always love asking this question. You know, are you, how do you get, how do you even get ready for this? Do you get to learn the new songs live? I mean, I'm sure there's so much that goes into it that people don't even know. A lot of kind of arguing on WhatsApp about when we can practice and uh, <laughs> yeah. what we can play. So we're currently going through that, trying to figure it all out. Um, but yeah, just a lot of practicing. For me, I have to practice a lot because um, vocally, it's like a muscle, you know, so if you don't kind of work it out, then you just get like three days into a tour and you just lose your voice kind of thing. So um, I have to kind of spend at least like a month to six weeks before a tour kind of like singing the set every day, you know, which is... a it's tough because it's never quite the same and you, you feel like prepared going into a tour, but singing in, in your like little home studio is not the same as singing in front of totally. like a couple yeah. thousand people. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know, practicing a bunch and especially when you're going into like a new album cycle, there's stuff that you've got to play that you never played before. And uh, there's always going to be teething problems with that. So yeah, just a lot of kind of working the kinks out. And we, we like to try and uh, add stuff when we play new stuff live and or any music live kind of so that, because we a lot of bands do i'm not trying to shit on a lot of bands when i say this but a lot of bands use so much kind of like playback and tracks and stuff that a lot of what you're hearing just is the stems from the record kind of live oh, yeah. um yeah. and we we do use some some tracks and stuff um some of the synth parts and things but not much and, and we like to try and like give a real like live experience you know we just play we play with amps and pedals and we don't play to like we don't have like a computer like press start start the show kind of thing so um it is you know it's like a real show so we, we try and like adapt things and, and give people a reason to come and watch us play that is different from on the record and we we sound quite different live to the record as well we sound a bit a bit heavier i think and um i like that i like that there's kind of two versions of, of the band in that sense yeah that's that's exciting you know going to really play all over the world and show that to different people too and, and get to be on the cusp of this this record dropping people getting to hear new stuff you getting to play it for people what are you most excited to play what what songs are you kind of digging or ready to go oh dude well i'll tell you when i find out what we're playing because the, the the fellas just can't can't agree <laughs> <laughs> but uh we've been playing heat me up which is our latest single um on our tour last month and uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, or last week we played a festival and it just straight away sounded good which is new stuff isn't always the case you know you kind of have to chip away at it for a while to get it to sound sound great but um this one just kind of out of the box was was ready to go and uh, and i've really been enjoying playing it it's like challenging but super fun and so i'm excited to play that and yeah i think i think we're going to play quite a lot of, of sundiver on the on the tour so I'm, I'm excited for all of it really and i like putting together a set list so that the set feels like it has a bit of a journey as well so it's not just kind of like blocks of this is this and this fits with this but but like i say because we don't use those crazy um neural guitar things and fake amps we actually have to tune the guitars in between every song so sometimes we have to oh, wow. like yeah. be logistical and and just group stuff together because they're in the same tune and because otherwise it'd be like big gaps in between every song and you got to think about like timings and flow and all that kind of stuff so some of it is just logistical and boring but um, we try and get around that wherever we can when, when there is some butting of heads do you take it to vote like henry gets two votes he's the vocalist bassist doesn't get a vote you know <laughs> ouch <laughs> dude occasionally yeah but it's the best thing having five members because there's always a tiebreaker oh they it never <laughs> you know what i mean you can always reach a resolution that way and and we've come to be i mean usually in the in the like the last like five or six years of our career we we spent so much time together we all get on so well that usually we, we all kind of think pretty similarly about things but we'll definitely sometimes come to sort of we'll think different things and then yeah the voting system does it does work you know i know people that are in like four pieces that just there's deadlocks that have lasted They're years deadlocks. they just can't they can't get around it but. stuck yeah no we're never exactly. doing that because we can't we can't decide we can't uh, come up with a majority <laughs> totally yeah it's kind of been an ongoing shtick where I just, I guess it's intentional. Intentional just shit on bassist because I used to play, and uh... <laughs> yeah, that's the only reason you do it, right? right. That's the only reason I do it. <laughs> Our bassist Dan kind of runs things, so uh, 
I'd be uh, I'd be wary of shitting on him to be honest. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. <laughs> He's the king. Anything you want to hit that we didn't hit? No, ju- just to say, uh, you know, if you if you haven't if you're found the podcast and haven't necessarily listened to us, please do check our our record out and give it a give it a spin. And and if you're listening to us because you do know who we are, like thank you so much for your support and um, and for kind of sticking with us all these years because it's been about ten years now, which is which is crazy. That is crazy. The, the time flies, but um, it's been a lot of fun. So um, so yeah, thank you to you guys as well for for having me. Yeah, you guys, especially this record, I think if you're a fan of this podcast, Boston Manor is a perfect band for you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> that's awesome. Pa- past and present. You, you'll, you'll dig, again, if you're a, a fan of us, you'll, you'll definitely dig the new record. That's nice. Thank you, guys. Yeah, uh, we'll, yeah we Henry, appreciate your you. time today, Henry, and we'll, uh, we'll be looking forward to seeing what you guys got coming for us later in the year and the, the record dropping on September 6th. Oh, my pleasure, dude. Uh, thank, thank you, guys, and um, yeah, hopefully we can we can hang out if we we get to the states anytime again soon. That'd be great. Yeah, north, northeast. Yeah. We'll hold you to that. We'll hold you to that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Henry. Awesome. Cheers, guys. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast. There. Email us at Patio Slave Podcast at gmail dot com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you.